our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Herman, is president of Osterpeeler Stockert E.B. A nonprofit organization of volunteers operating the Osterpeeler Stockard Radio Observatory in Germany. He received his PhD in physics in 1979 from the University of Bonn. His professional career has been primarily in the telecommunication industry. He is now retired and enjoying working in the field of radio astronomy and trying to make the best use of the instrument of the observatory, which includes a 25 meter dish. His presentation will give insights into the, uh, this great instrument. Okay, um, Wolfgang. Well, ahead. thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much. Let me just go in and share. So, I hope this is coming up now. Is my screen coming up? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Um, as the title says, and the purpose of my talk is to give an overview of what can be done in radio astronomy by amateurs. Uh, what are also the limitations and maybe things that you want to do and maybe things that you don't want to do. Um, in the course of this talk, I will give a couple of examples from various amateur observatories. And let me just uh, point out that the examples I have selected, this is kind of arbitrary. So when in the, I've, I'm giving a certain example, that doesn't mean that this has been a particularly good example or a well done example. I want to mention that because I know that in some cases people have done similar things of equal quality and that doesn't mean any valuation. Uh, it was just a, a matter of practicality. Um, Second brief comment, um, thank you very much, Rich, uh, for giving me a very generous time allocation for this talk. And uh, indeed, I have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Um, given that long time, I would suggest that uh, we don't wait with questions until to the very end. I will make breaks in between for, uh, to answer questions whenever I have uh, reached a certain point or uh, concluded a certain subject. And I wouldn't even mind if somebody just in between um, opens his mic and asks a question. So we're, we're a relatively <clears throat> small community with some 30 people, so that might be doable. But anyway, please don't hesitate uh, asking any questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer those. Okay, now let's get into things. And uh, maybe we start a little bit with a question, what are amateurs anyway? So who's an amateur? And uh, it really uh, doesn't mean, in, in the context, it's often meant it's sort of uh, doing things not in a professional uh, manner or so. No, I think the definition of an amateur is somebody who just does it for joy rather than professional reasons. So he's get, getting no financial benefits for, from it. But um, I think we all should strive to be professional amateurs in the sense that we do things in a scientific way. And uh, being an amateur in radio astronomy obviously comes with a number of limitations. And uh, when we start, we start with a limited expertise. Obviously, we have financial <clears throat> constraints uh, depending on our personal situation. There's limited time available. Size of a team, many of us are just a single person doing things. And uh, if you want to lift a 10 meter dish with a single person, just, just, that's, that just doesn't work. So you have limitations there. Uh, if you build your telescope, you have limited space. Um, your better half might also impose some restrictions on the size of telescope you put in the garden. And everybody has a certain degree of RFI. Now, the funny thing is, if you ask uh, the professionals, uh, they complain about the same limitations, more or less. Uh, they have limited expertise. They the budget is constrained. They don't have time uh, because they need to do uh, education and, and uh, read their lectures. Size of team uh, frequency limited. The only thing that they don't are not concerned is space uh, because they don't build, typically don't build a telescope. But they have a much more significant restriction. They have limited observation time. So whenever they want to do something, 
um, they need to apply for observation times. That's something that we don't have to do. And of course, they also have their share of RFI. So in, re in fact, um, we are all limited in our research. Uh, it's just on a somewhat different level, but the subjects where you are, find your limitations are more or less the same. When uh, people go into amateur radio astronomy, I find that they typically come from two areas. Um, there are the ham radio operators uh, who are getting interested for some reason in astronomy and uh, think that that is very good with their uh, background. But then they don't have typically don't have astronomical background. So that's part of the learning curve they have to go through. And on the other side, people come from the optical astronomy, often motivated by bad weather, uh, light pollution, and so on. Um, and they are attracted by the fact that radio astronomy can be done anytime, not just during the nighttime. And uh, they run into the issue, they don't have RX, RF experience, typically. What both typically have in common is that uh, radio objects in the sky are completely new to them. That's a subject area that they just have to learn new. And typically also they have limited background in physics. Well, having said that, your mileage, your personal mileage might vary. You may have a very good background in physics or whatever. But this is what I typically find in people that are going into radio astronomy. And consequently, um, there's a learning curve, quite a substantial learning curve. Um, people may have to learn about astronomical coordinates. And there are two important also related things. Um, the radio emission of the characteristic of the radio emission of astronomical objects is something that has to be learned. And that is also related to the order of magnitude of those uh, objects or those emissions versus the sensitivity that you have with your telescope. So getting an idea of certain objects, can you see that, can you see that not? Uh, how is that from the order of magnitude is something that's new that has to be learned. RF design, depending on where you come from, something that needs to be learned. Software, some people are just uh, very good, have a big track record in software, others not. And what's typically new uh, is the interpretation of results. So these are typically the areas of the learning curve that people have to go through. And uh, depending on your background, that's one or the other part that's uh, particularly challenging. People, when they enter into radio astronomy, typically ask one big question. What can be observed and what is needed? And there's not an easy answer to that. Um, the uh, answer is, can be quite different. What can be observed? Quite different objects. And also, consequently, the need for certain equipment can be different. So let's go through a list as a sort of a starting guideline also for this talk. Um, what are the objects that amateurs can observe? First of all, there's the sun. Um, it's a big object right in front of our nose. It's uh, mostly a thermal emission because of the temperature of the solar surface, but as we have learned in the introductory video, we also um, have an influence on the ionosphere, which can be monitored, and there are bursts of radio emission, which can be monitored. So this is one area, and uh, we already heard something about that. Jupiter is the only planet that we can observe as amateurs. Um, all the others are just too weak to uh, be of any noticeable effect for amateurs. And also the Jupiter emission has already been mentioned in the introductory video. Also, uh, again, it has been mentioned the meteors, which can be monitored as one of the subject areas for amateurs. Quite many people are very active in there. Then 
uh, we have, uh, which actually is a bit of my famous uh, subject as an entry topic, um, that's hydrogen emission, the Milky Way. We just heard Charles how that can be done. And um, then if your appetite is wettened by the Milky Way, you may want to go and also look for other galaxies, see whether you can see the hydrogen emission there. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then there's a subject area <clears throat> which I just call exotic hydrogen. I'll explain later on what I mean by that, something that is also worthwhile observing. Um, takes a bit more of an effort, uh, but that's another area which I would like to cover. Mesas have recently been mentioned um, in the introductory vi uh, video. That's again, a different source, a different type of source that can be monitored and observed by amateurs. And then we have what we call the continuum sources. Continuum, they're called continuum sources because the emission is over a very wide range of the spectrum. So they radiate over a large spectrum in the RF range. Typical sources for that kind of uh, emission are supernova remnants. Cassiopeia A has been mentioned in that context already. Star formation regions in our Milky Way um, can be observed and radio galaxies, uh, the famous uh, three, what was that? Three, three, two, seven, three was mentioned as one of the historical examples. Then of course, many people are uh, very much interested in observing pulsars. Uh, so we need to have a look at what is needed for that and what are the prerequisites for that. And then finally, um, this is not an object that can be observed. I put it in this list because it deserves a separate uh, discussion. That's interferometry, what can be done as amateurs in interferometry. So what I'm trying to do in this talk is really to go over, over these different subjects in more or less detail um, to see what can be done, where, where are the limits. I would like to um, start talking about things I won't talk about. Uh, what does that mean? Um, there are a few subject areas, and I will start with those where I don't have personal experience. Uh, I do not have any hands-on experience, so I'm a bit hesitant to talk in any depth about it. But the fortunate thing is <clears throat> that those subject areas have already been covered to some extent in the video. And we'll also hear other talks that will deal with that. So what are those things? Um, coming back again to the sun. Um, the sun is a thermal radiator and is actually not a strong radio signal. Uh, or the, the, the sun is not very strong in radio emission. The reason why we see it so strong is because it's so close. It's only eight minutes, eight light minutes away. And this is why it's strong, it's just close. Uh, if it were a little bit further away, we would just not see it. But it can be very nicely used as a test source. And uh, there's this very simple setup possible, the ITBT telescope, um, which is uh, quite, uh, a nice entry project. SID um, that was mentioned in the um, introductory video, and uh, there's more about it in later talks in this uh, conference. So it's an indirect observation um, that was explained quite nicely in, in the uh, video. It's the influence of the solar radiation on the ionosphere, which changes the radio propagation path. Then there's a project called ECALISTO, uh, again for observing uh, solar bursts uh, that observes in the VHF and UHF range over a wide frequency range. I have uh, put some uh, web resources on this slide, so anybody who is not familiar with that, uh, just feel uh, you should go to those uh, websites and have a look there and see what you can learn about. Jupiter. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's the only uh, 
planet that we can observe as amateurs. There is a decametric radio emission uh, due to the magnetosphere of the Jupiter. I won't go into any detail of that. You see the drawing here on the left. I am not going to explain that. I would recommend you to go to the website to learn more about it. Um, the interesting thing in particular is that the moon Io has a very significant impact on what Jupiter does in terms of radio emission. So it's a scientifically quite interesting thing. There is a program, Radio Jove, um, which uh, is intended to observe that. And it uh, delivers uh, receivers and so on, which we will probably hear more about it in a later talk. It does require a bit of an antenna setup. This is the setup which is always quoted in the context of uh, this uh, project from Dave Tipinski. And the uh, receiver has already been introduced earlier. Uh, it's now going over to an SDR. Uh, and I'm, as far as I recall, especially that development will be covered in a later talk. So the final thing uh, I don't want to talk about, uh, but just uh, show a brief slide <clears throat> is meteors. Uh, we have learned that this is a uh, reflection of the ionization trail that was shown in the video with a nice graph. So the essential scheme is that a uh, meteor enters the atmosphere, it ionizes uh, the air, radio waves get reflected and all of a sudden you hear something that you are not able to hear otherwise. This is a very, very active uh, area of uh, people. Um, if I look at a German news or forum about radio astronomy, the vast majority of the posts are about this because it's very interesting in the sense there's happening, there's something happening. It's not uh, a dull um, object that remains the same all the time. It's really something that uh, all of a sudden comes something up. There are active phases, less active phases. So interesting subject. Again, I won't go into any details. So. This um, essentially concludes the, uh, the subject area where I say I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. And I, I now switch over to um, what I think is a very interesting and fairly easy low hanging fruit for amateur radio astronomy, and that's hydrogen emission, the 21 centimeter line. I call this my number one for everybody who wants to enter radio astronomy and also uh, that can keep you busy for a long, long, long time. <clears throat> Why is it good for beginners? It's fairly easy to build. There are a tremendous amount of options yet you have uh, for antennas. And it's a very good starting point. You can learn a lot of things by observing hydrogen. You can learn how to improve your instrument and how to optimize that. And it also has a lot of interesting physics involved, and we'll come to that. Just as a reminder, the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen, it's a fairly simple process, essentially. Uh, you have a hydrogen atom, which consists of a proton and an electron, and this has two states that the atom can be in. The proton and the electron spin can be parallel or it can be anti-parallel. Now, the anti-parallel situation has a slightly lower energy, so you have to put energy into the atom to go from here to there. And once it's in excited state, it drops back to the lower energy level and the energy difference is emitted as a radio emission or a photon of 12, 21 centimeter wavelengths or 1420 megahertz. Now, what do you need in order to observe that? Obviously, you need an antenna, very straightforward. Then you need a low noise amplifier, and Charles has been explaining about, uh, quite a bit about that. Um, <clears throat> there's also, in most cases, uh, you need a filter. Also, Charles has mentioned that explicitly, so that you do not overload your subsequent parts behind the low noise amplifier. 
in case of RFI and other interferers. When I say it may not be needed in each case, when you're in a very benign environment, uh, not many interferers, then it, you may get away without it, but typically you would need it. And then <clears throat> you today you will use a software-defined radio. There are other schemes. You can use a scanning receiver, whatever, uh, but really the way to go these days is to use a software-defined radio. And what, if you have a software-defined radio, obviously you need a PC and software for that. In uh, radio astronomy parlance, the uh, first part is always with the front end because that's where that's more or less right at the dish, and the back end is somewhere in your in your house. Let's go to the antenna and the antenna options that you have. And the answer, uh, what antenna can I use? The answer is anything goes. Uh, you cannot be wrong. Almost not wrong. You cannot do, uh, let me say it this way: you cannot evade something, hardly anything, that cannot receive hydrogen. We have um, heard quite a bit about the scope in the box, uh, which is depicted here, um, which is a small antenna intended for a completely different purpose, but just happens to work reasonably at hydrogen. Then, of course, on the high end. Uh, you can have a large dish. Uh, again, Charles has one of those, uh, even bigger than this one. Uh, this is another option. Then a nice setup also is a horn antenna, which is described by this uh, website from the West Virginia University. And also Charles has shown this uh, horn. He has been using the calibration horn or um, standard gain horn. Um, my personal favorite when it comes to making a very, very simple antenna for hydrogen reception is a coffee can, or in this case, it's a uh, piece of a uh, stovepipe. Uh, scientifically, it's a circular waveguide, and uh, that's already delivering your uh, signals. The, you can go even lower. This one here is a dipole with a balloon to uh, connect, and that's made from a piece of semi-rigid cable. That's a simple dipole, and as I will show you later on, this actually can be used to receive hydrogen. So, in a nutshell, uh, whatever your budget, your space, and so on will allow you, you will always find a space to put something up that can receive hydrogen. That's one of the reasons why I think it's a very good entry project. Then, I really can almost skip that um, after Charles' talk. Uh, low noise amplifiers and filters. Here's this famous uh, Sawbird again. Um, it's also interesting to compare notes. Charles has mentioned noise figure of 0.6. Uh, we had measured uh, 0.55 or three devices. Um, there's also a frequently used alternative, or an, I wouldn't say it's an alternative because this one has an integrated filter. And this is a pure LNA. Um, it's uh, based on an SPF, uh, which is a p uh transistor. Um, they can be purchased for in the order of six to ten dollars on eBay. Um, they used to be quite good. Uh, we typically measure 0.6 dB noise figure. However, recently we got a shipment of six of those and only three of those had 0.6. The other one said 2 dB, so quality varies. That was a bit of a disappointment. Just want to mention that. And of course, you, if you spend some more money, uh, you can buy a, let's call it a high-end uh, low noise amplifier. This one has a noise figure of 0.3 dB. Actually, the manufacturer specifies uh, it's not as good, but it's that's what we measured on two devices. And as far as filters are concerned, um, you can just make things very, fairly easy by using this uh, with an integrated filter. What I like is uh, also is this uh, cavity filter. Uh, cavity filters are typically mechanically difficult. You need a milling machine or whatnot. But this is a design that uh, can work with standard aluminum components which you can buy. And it's very easy to manufacture and they have excellent characteristics. Um, 
the link is given below. Uh, the guy behind it is Matthias Wittmar uh, from Slovenia, and he has done this clever design, which I like a lot, and we've built a couple of those. So that's uh, the LNR part. Then, um, so we, we are covered on the front end, and we need to go to the back end. Again, we have seen some comments from Charles already. There's the LT, RTL SDR. There are many, many variants. Um, there, are, this is the one that's used with the scope in the box. Um, it's a simple, uh, limited bandwidth. And then there are a whole bunch of others: uh, Hack RF1, Lime SDR, Adam Pluto, AirSpy SDR Play, uh, the whole range of products from Etos Research and Blade RF. Um, all of these can be used. Um, they come, of course, they in different price ranges, have different bandwidth. They have various uh, pros and cons, um, which is certainly worth going into that in much detail, but we don't have the time in this overview talk. And it's also uh, uh, would be a nice project to do a really, really uh, detailed comparison between that. We have used or tested all of these with the exception of the Blade RF. This one we didn't get our hands on yet. And of course, from the Atos range products, we just had one of the many products that they have. In a nutshell, all of them work uh, for the purpose of hydrogen reception. And uh, that's uh, the good news. And depending on what your future ambitions are, you may want to go to a cheap one or more capable one. A little bit of a comment on the FunCube dongle, which was also uh, mentioned in the video. I have some hesitation to recommend that for hydrogen because of the very low bandwidth. So you need to go to a scanning scheme. Uh, it has some, just some 200 kilowatts of bandwidth. That's not sufficient to cover the full hydrogen line. So you have to scan over the frequency and that uh, comes um, with a number of disadvantages. So. Um, in my view, you're, you're better off with one of the others. Now, if you have a software defined radio, uh, well, the radio itself doesn't come with a software. Uh, the definition of the software is in the PC. And we, uh, here we are getting a little bit in a difficult water um, because there are different uh, software pieces of software around. And uh, they are also further in development. I know Ted Klein is working on something. Uh, I've put here a list on uh, a number of uh, possibilities. Uh, we have heard something about the SDR Sharp with the IF Average plugin from Charles. Um, and um, this is one of the few Windows options. There is something made by Michiel Klaassen, CFRAT also, which also uses SDR Sharp in the background. And um, then there are others. It's, first of all, I haven't tested all of them. Um, second, uh, it would be very cumbersome uh, go, uh, going into a detailed uh, comparison. In the annex to this, presentation, which is in the in material that you have received. There's again a list of these, um, giving a little bit of background about the technology behind it and also who authored them and how you can get a hold of that. And um, that's probably for a beginner, one of the more difficult things uh, to install the software, especially if it's an, a Linux based system and to learn to work with them, but it is worth doing it. So. Now we essentially have our ingredients uh, together. So we have some sort of an antenna. We have our LNA with filter. We have our SDR, and then we have our soft piece of software. Now we start observing, and let me give you one example. We're looking at the hydrogen in the Milky Way. And this example is from a three meter dish. Um, what is on, on the left is just one location in the sky uh, with a spectrum shown. 
in this case it's calibrated uh, in intensity so the left uh, it's not, not written here but the vertical scale is in kelvin brightness temperature and the frequency which is up here is converted to a velocity so we see the various doppler velocities of that location now what you can do which is in my view an interesting experiment uh, if you have a three meter dish and or a smaller dish or whatever you just let it sit there and look straight up so what will happen then is that the Milky Way will pass over, the hydrogen signal will come and go, and if you record that, you will see how it varies over time. And this is shown in the graph here, um, which is as the Earth rotates, you are going in the right ascension from zero to 24, so one full rotation of the Earth. And it's uh, just looking straight up. So the declination will vary as we turn it around. And in the vertical scale, we have the velocity and the color denotes intensity. So this is, if you want to say it that way, is one vertical line. So one spectrum is one vertical cross section here. And what you can see is that the velocity distribution varies. The uh, intensity varies and you see that the milky way passes overhead two times now what is this here this curved line this curved line as you can imagine is not of astronomical origin it's an rfi line and this is actually this line here it's at 1420 megahertz and you may remember um uh, the uh presentation from Charles, he had the same spurious line there. So it's coming from either inside the uh, SDR or from, from the computer. So whatsoever, we haven't identified the exact source yet. Now, why is that a curved line? Well, what we are doing here is we account for the fact that we are rotating around the sun, which gives an additional velocity. And we correct for that because depending in which direction we are looking, as the Earth rotates, that contribution of the rotation of the Earth around the sun varies. And we correct that, and that means that a fixed frequency all of a sudden becomes a variable velocity. So we see here the actual velocity of the Milky Way. Okay, this is a transit scan, and you can do that with any antenna that I have mentioned. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so this is the same thing just with a dipole and you will see it's noisier a single spectrum can still be very nicely seen it is noisier but you can still see the dual transit of the milky way it's much broader the dipole doesn't have hardly any resolution the directional resolution is very poor but you can still identify that there's something in this up in the sky that goes overhead and disappears and comes again what you may ask yourself uh, if i switch back and forth why is this jumping up and down why i'm not getting the same velocities well the, the reason here is simply that in this case we have not corrected for the rotation of the earth around the sun <clears throat> simply because it doesn't make sense uh, the, the correction depends on the direction that you're looking and a dipole is looking at a very, very wide range. So you don't know wh what direction am I using for the correction. So we left the correction out. But what I want to demonstrate with that is that's a easy thing to get to see the Milky Way. The next interesting experiment, so one step up is to do the classical experiment, look at the rotation curve of the Milky Way. Um, here we have again a similar drawing, similar scheme. Many um, spectra taken, but in this case, it is always looking at the galactic plane. So in this case, it's with a, with a movable dish, which always steers at the galactic plane. And we scan in galactic longitude. So we have galactic latitude zero, and galactic longitude as far as we can see it from our location. 
And we see <clears throat> again how the hydrogen intensity and uh, velocity distribution changes. Now, how do I get from there to the rotation of the galaxy? The scheme is that you, and you don't need to take so many um, uh, spectra, the idea is that you evaluate what is the highest redshifted velocity that I can see. And you do that up to the galactic longitude of 90. So tip, maybe you take these number of measurements and look at the spectrum and look what is the highest uh, velocity. Now, what do you do with that? There is something called the target point method. And again, this is something which would probably take 20 minutes to explain in detail. So I have to skip that a bit. The basic idea behind that is that if I'm looking a certain direction, the highest velocity that I will see is the part of the uh, hydrogen cloud that is moving exactly in the direction of my uh, where I'm looking in the same direction. So it's moving away from me, but exactly in the line of sight. And that allows me a uh, simple calculation of how far is that cloud away from the galactic center. As I said, it's called a tangent point method. I can't, for timing reasons, explain that in detail in this overview. What I uh, suggest, but, but there are many, many explanations of that. Uh, I have listed one here in the uh, uh, below, a web resource that you can have a look, but there are others if you put in the tongue and point as the search in Google, then you will get a number of explanations. The basic uh, thing here is that I can, with the help of that tongue and point method, uh, determine the velocity, the rotation velocity of the galaxy as it varies in the distance from the galactic center with, with my measurement, which delivers me two pieces of information. One is the galactic longitude I'm looking at, this angle. That's just where my telescope is pointing, which I should know. And then the maximum velocity that I have measured. And then I need to throw in two more parameters. One is the distance of the sun from the galactic center, which can be taken from literature, and the rotation of the, uh, rotation of the sun around the galactic center, which is also a literature value, which is not determined by your measurement. And then you can draw and plot your relation here. What is interesting about that, and still puzzling, is that it doesn't drop. If you look at the rotation of our planets around the sun, that drops. The, the rotation speed goes to the outside. With these constant, more or less constant rotation of the galaxy to the out, when, it, when it goes out, that means that there has to be have to be gravitational forces that are bigger than what our stars or the collection of stars in the Milky Way can produce. And that is a mystery still. It's called dark matter something that nobody knows what it is, at least not by now. And you, for this experiment, you can demonstrate basic, a basic physical problem or a problem of astrophysics of these days by your small telescope saying, okay, I see the rotation velocity. And that is quite, a, quite an uh, interesting point uh, that you can do basic physics or at least the basic physical questions with your small amateur radio telescope. Next thing is that you want to do is I'm tired, sick and tired of my galaxy. I want to go outside. Um, about, but uh, hold on a second. Maybe I stop here and see whether there are any questions at this point. Rich, I can't, because I have gone full screen, I can't see uh, the, uh, the chat. Is, are there any in the chat? No, no chat items yet. Okay, so I go ahead. Yeah, anybody have any questions? You guys go ahead. Okay. Um, you're sick and tired of our galaxy, right? Uh, so let's go and uh, see whether we can see that same hydrogen emission from an extragalactic source. And <clears throat> I'm showing here the work from 
Jean-Jacques Mantou from France. He calls himself always JJ. And he has a very nice three meter dish. And um, it's a fairly sensitive instrument with only 60K system temperature. And he's recorded this spectrum, um, which is from the Andromeda galaxy. And another one from the M33, another galaxy. What you see here is what is typical for uh, these type of galaxies is sort of a double, double hump uh, structure. So he did that. Uh, and I want to show that this is not so easy. Um, because the first thing that he did was he did take care that his spec spectrum is very flat. So this is a four megahertz width of spectrum. And this is one of the key success factors. Uh, this was what he had previously with some ups and downs, uh, some reflections or whatever. And in this case, you wouldn't be able to see because these fluctuations are much, much bigger than the uh, change from that spectrum. So taking care that he really has a very uh, flat spectrum and has a good system sensitivity, that was the key success factor there. And I want to demonstrate uh, that this is not so easy and that there are certain limitations of doing that. Um, what I have done is I have taken survey data and simulated the signal that you would get with antennas of different diameters. This is the, uh, the source of the data is a so-called lab survey and um, there's a website um, which is listed down be here, down here, where you can simulate for different antenna or beam beam width, which converts to uh, antenna sizes. So I've done that for seven down to four degrees uh, of that. Uh, that corresponds to uh, antennas of this size, if they're if they're reaching the theoretical uh, beam size. So you can see that the that the signal drops dramatically as your beam width goes wider and your your antenna gets smaller, and this is just the effect of the beam width. So the um, <clears throat> spectrum from JJ was probably the like the green one. Um, that's five degree beam width. That's probably what he had with his antenna, and if you get smaller, that's getting very very difficult. So uh, I would say three meters is the minimum that you need to have in order to observe a extragalactic spectrum. Uh, put things a bit more, even more in perspective. I have two more uh, graphs here. So we have this and this, oops, this one is just showing the full hydrogen line from our own galaxy. So you can see it's just a very tiny little bit here. And that even worse, this is not a place where the hydrogen is particularly strong. If you put this against a another location in the uh, galactic plane, you would probably get a hydrogen, or you will get a hydrogen signal like this. And this is already a small hydrogen signal, and then that's even smaller. So if you are seeing the hydrogen line <clears throat> in the galactic plane, think of it, it has tens of Kelvins, and an ex, uh, a extra galactic uh, hydrogen from M33 is 0.15 Kelvin. So you really have to have a very well optimized instrument. But now you want to say, hey, wait a minute, what's this here? I can st still see that. That's uh, from the green curve. So let's a magnifying glass look into there. So again, we have our M33 spectrum, but on this other location, that's a different location, we see something which doesn't quite belong to the uh, our normal hydrogen spectrum, but is stronger than what we can see from this galaxy. So what is this? And I call this among this, uh, this heading exotic hydrogen. Uh, these are high velocity clouds. These are clouds, and I show a graph of that, uh, that sort of come from outside of our galaxy and, and fall into our galaxy. And these can actually be 
received with a, a three meter dish quite reasonably. Um, this is our own three meter dish. Uh, that's a 30 minutes integration time. And this is the high velocity cloud, which can be seen. And that of course is the hydrogen from the galactic plane. And that can even be done as we have seen uh, with a smaller dish. There's an experiment by Job uh, with a, his 1.5 meter dish. He took one, uh, he took five hours integration time. So it's, um, yeah, he compensated the smaller aperture uh, with integration time, and he was able to see that a little bit. So, um, where do those come from? There are different theories where that comes from. Um, <clears throat> these high velocity clouds can either come from primordial gas clouds, which have uh, come in a very early time and sort of are collected by the gravity field and uh, are then falling into our galaxy. Another theory is that something has happened in our galaxy um, that has thrown out uh, hydrogen like uh, a uh, supernova explosion or something like that, and that's falling in again. And then there could be an interaction between satellite galaxies and ourselves. That's an unresolved um, uh, question or where do they come from? The main message here is high velocity clouds are something that can be seen with amateur size equipment. To finish off exotic hydrogen, um, the final mention of something which is even more exotic, these are radio recombination line. What happens there is that um, if you look at the scheme of hydrogen um, in the optical regime, you have the alpha line, which is a red line. You have a, a alpha one line, which is in the ultraviolet. A uh, three alpha um, is in the infrared. And as you go up in the energy levels of the hydrogen, you end up in spacings, which are again in the radio regime. So what happens if, if you are in an environment where the hydrogen gets ionized, so the electron is taken away from it, the hydrogen will then eventually collect its electron again or somebody else's electron and recombine being again a hydrogen atom, but being in a very, very highly uh, excited state. And as these excited states decay, they emit again, radiation in the radio regime. And there are a number of radio recombination lines which are close to the hydrogen line. And these can also be observed. Now, I have to say that so far, it has not been achieved by observing these radio recombination line with a smaller size uh, dish. This is a example from a 25 meter dish. Um, our 25 meter dish. This is a hydrogen recombination line in the Oreo Nebula. You need something that excites uh, that to, you have to have ultraviolet radiation to excite that. And you can see a fairly decent signal. Um, that's actually comparable to um, the uh, emission from the other galaxies. So it might be doable to do that with a small dish. This line over here actually is not from hydrogen, it's from carbon. That's a carbon recombination line because you also have other atoms and they can also give rise to a recombination line. So um, that sort of concludes uh, what I can say about the hydrogen. Um, if we take hydrogen, we can do mapping of the hydrogen. We can determine the rotation curve. We can observe high velocity clouds. Extragalactic there, it's getting difficult and radio combination line is probably more difficult. And there are two areas I have not covered uh, because they are essentially the area of bigger telescopes like ours. Uh, these are absorption spectra towards high luminosity sources and some deep space hydrogen clouds. That's the story of hydrogen. So question about that? Rich, anything? No, still nothing on chat. Anybody else have any questions? So it seems like it's important to keep your signal to noise levels in in uh, good order. 
And the better you do at that, the, the more advanced uh, work you could do. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, <clears throat> these, uh, these more exotic things there are much weaker than the main hydrogen line. And uh, the key element there is really signal to noise ratio, good uh, aperture illumination. And of course, uh, nothing works better than a bigger dish. So, uh, but again, what I want to show is what is the, let's say the limit of the possibilities if you're in the two to three meter range of dishes, what can be done? Any further questions? I have a, a comment there that uh, hydrogen uh, clouds are uh, you know, extended sources. And as a consequence, if you look at an extended source with a narrower beam width, you'll see more resolution, but you'll pick up less energy because you're not picking up as much of the source. So that's going to kind of cancel the dish size. I think that may be why the dipole picks something up. It sees hydrogen over a very large area. Is that uh, correct, uh, Wolfgang? That's that's perfectly correct. Um, in uh, if you had a if you had the hydrogen completely evenly distributed, um, the size of the antenna versus the opening angle would exactly cancel. So you would always get the same signal, only that your spatial resolution is reduced, and that's that's exactly what what happens there. And this is the reason why you can see hydrogen still with a small dipole. It's just looking at lots and lots and lots of hydrogen. Okay, um, let's continue by adding some oxygen, oxygen to the hydrogen and we have OH. OH is a radical, so it's an incomplete module desperately looking for yet another H to form water, but uh, there's no other hydrogen available right now. And this OH has four transitions in the L band. So in the region where typically our uh, hydrogen equipment works at least close by. Um, these four transitions, they can be observed in emission and absorption, but really what's most interesting for us <clears throat> in the uh, amateur arena are OH mazes. Um, and these are circumstances <clears throat> where you have a strong infrared radiation, which excites the OH uh, to a high vibrational level, and then it decays, and uh, then it starts to uh, getting a... Uh, inversion situation, a uh, inversion between the different uh, levels of the hyperfine structure, and then it starts to mate. Um, the nice thing about uh, sorry, OH is that in most cases, you will be able to use your equipment that you have built for hydrogen. You can use it for OH uh, emission as well. You may have, obviously, you may have to change the filter if you're using any, but uh, that's uh, all you need. Typically, the LNA and so on will be wideband enough, and also the SDRs will cover that. <clears throat> and there are a few examples which I want to show um, um, with three meter dishes. That's the sort of the size where uh, you can uh, <clears throat> do these kinds of observations. Um, these uh, the three on top are done from uh, with a three meter dish uh, from Eduard. And uh, there are what are called circumstellar mesa. So they are around a infra, big infrared star. So the infrared radiation from a star generates the energy which uh, makes them a mesa. The um, <clears throat> other example shown here is uh, from, again, from JJ, who I have mentioned before, but um, also with a smaller dish in a two meter class, uh, Job has been able to observe a mesa. It's a sort of a weak at the limit of the acceptable signal to noise ratio, but still I believe it's a valid because the line is exactly at the right frequency. So really uh, OH mesas is something to go into once you are sick and tired of hydrogen. So just throw in a little oxygen and you're there. Other mazes are also observable. There are methanol mazes and water mazes. Methanol mazes, um, they are at six gigahertz and at 12 gigahertz, but it's more convenient for amateurs to observe it at 12 gigahertz 
because standard LNBs can be used. Um, the standard LNBs have one issue, um, or at least the older ones, that frequency accuracy and stability is an issue. Um, but the more modern um, LNBs, they have a PLL, so they have a little crystal inside at uh, either, I think, at 25 or 28 megahertz, and you just throw out that crystal and inject a external clock, which is tied to a reference standard or whatever you may have available. And then you have a receiving uh, system, which is fairly frequency accurate, and you can observe that. And I'll show you examples of that. The second option that we have as amateurs is to observe at 22 gigahertz. Um, it's a little bit more tricky because LNBs are not readily available. Um, there are some KA band uh, LNBs, but they're hard to come by. And the external clocking there is a little bit more difficult. The good news about the water mazes is that uh, they flare. They, they are very variable, but occasionally they really get very, very bright in the tens of thousands of Janskis, and they got really, really strong. Some examples um, of what has been done. Um, this is our own uh, experiment. Um, that's with our 10 meter dish, uh, 10 minutes integration time, a methanol mazes around the uh, star forming region uh, W3. And <clears throat> the question of course is, uh, well, you got your this 10 meter dish. Uh, I only got a one meter dish. Um, so it's, it's not an option for me. That's um, it's a factor 100 in collecting area to compensate with integration time. That's 10,000 times the integration time. So I'm at 1,600 hours integration time. So no way I can do that. Well, not so fast. If you give up a bit in spectral resolution, uh, a factor of five, and give up a factor of SNR, so I'm going there, maybe I can live with less spectral resolution. Maybe I can give up with the SNR uh, signal. Then I end up with theoretically 20 hours observation time to, do, to see that source. And indeed, Edward has done that. Uh, he did that with a one meter dish, um, 17 hours integration time. So it was just sitting there and, and tracking and tracking. And he has, because you can't collect at the, his location 17 hours of integration time um, all the time. So he had to accumulate over uh, three, three days or so to get those 17 hours. Of course, you need a tracking uh, setup. So he has a mount here, which tracks the source, but then you're able with a standard LNB to observe a methanol mazes. So that's, uh, I find this quite impressive that uh, a one meter dish is capable of doing that. Now, how about the water, ma water mazer? Um, again, this is our 10 meter dish, uh, 60 seconds integration time. I mean, these, these guys are really strong. Um, so anyone with a one meter dish going for the challenge? Sure enough, there is a, one example, it's a, it's a different source. Um, it's a W49 in this case, and this is a bit weaker uh, even. So this is a spectrum we have taken with 10 minute, uh, minutes integration time in January of 2019. This year, May, Michael Klaassen, who has a 9.3 meter dish, did that with the same integration time and again recorded a spectrum. You will notice this spectrum is completely different from this one. This is because these uh, are highly variable. Um, they change their spectrum, uh, they get more and less intense and so on. The interesting thing is that Eduard, who did this with the methanol mazes, tried that with his one meter dish with a, uh, yeah, with a one meter dish and at about the same time. So you see the spectrum is the same and he was able to do that. I do not, unfortunately, I do not, I couldn't find out his integration time. It's probably, again, something like 20 hours or so to, to get to that. But you can see that the spectrum that is taken here with a nine meter class dish very nicely reproduces with this one meter dish. Just have to have lots of patience to do that. 
So um, in summary, um, OH, methanol and water masons are observable with MS2 size equipment, even with relatively moderate size. In most cases, um, a tracking mount will be required. So you need to be able to follow that for a long time to get the, uh, uh, get the required observation time. And um, the interesting thing there is that it does, uh, these, because these change, you can do the observation over and over again, again and again, see what, what happens there, because that's something that the big telescope, they, they cannot do that. They cannot follow that for such a long time and look at the variations. You can actually even do some interesting in science. All right, this is my MESA summary. So again, would take the um, opportunity to answer any, any questions that might have arised. Rich, are there any? Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the MASER action itself. It's just super radiant amplification of background radiation, is it not? Yeah, it, essentially it is. I, I mean, uh, a MASER in a typical view by people is that it has to have mirrors reflecting things back and forth. And that is replaced in the case of astronomical masers just by the sheer length of the amplifying medium. So you have a uh, uh, level inversion that extends over a very, very large uh, length. And that makes the essentially the maser process. So you, essentially this, the starting point, you have one uh, molecule going over the transition, emitting a photon, and then it, it continues to make stimulated emission along the path of the amplifying medium. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. Uh, why is there so much variation? The, um, <clears throat> well, the, the stars are variable. Uh, it's also a, a relatively limited area. I mean, we're, we're not talking about uh, tens of uh, thousands of light years of the medium, we are talking about the vicinity of a star. So we are talking light hours maybe at most, or maybe a few light hours. And obviously the variability of the uh, material there, there's much more fluctuation. And just like our sun varies quite a bit, the, the star varies quite a bit and that makes these mazes vary. Okay, any further questions? All right, so next subject, continuum sources. Um, <clears throat> normally you would say, uh, why, why are we uh, doing all this uh, spectral thing, mazes and, and hydrogen and, and so on? Why not we not just looking at things that sit there in the sky and emit quietly uh, just like we do it with stars. We take our, uh, our telescope, our optical telescope, put it out there and see, oh, there's something which is shining. Why are we not doing the same thing? Uh, why are we not recommending doing that? Um, because there are these things. There's a supernova remnants, uh, Cassiopeia A, A, Crab nebula, whatever, then there are star forming regions, then there's uh, <clears throat> radio galaxies, the sun we already talked about, which is which is strong, and the moon. And <clears throat> so these are the things. Why are, am I bringing that up only now? Well, the reason is it's not so easy. So <clears throat> a continuum source is a source that has a very broad spectrum. Um, so it emits over a very wide range. What can you expect to observe? Um, we, let's start with the radiometer equation, which says <clears throat> my RMS noise that I'm having is determined by the system temperature. So the better I am with the system temperature, the better. And if <clears throat> I have a certain system temperature, I can improve my signal, my, my noise by increasing the bandwidth. So having more bandwidth is beneficial and integration time. I just look at things longer. And that goes with the square root of both. Another equation that we should look at is the aperture efficiency. Um, that's a 
how much of the energy that I am receiving with my dish. So this is antenna area times the source flux. So this is what it is incident on my antenna or my dish. Uh, and this is what I'm actually getting. So I'm not getting 100%. I'm getting only part of it. Typical numbers are 50, 60%, maybe up to 70% for parabolic dishes. Now, <clears throat> let's take those two equations and have a look what kind of sources we might be able to detect. So again, this is our radiometer equation. And <clears throat> let's take a three meter dish. 100K system temperature, 50% aperture efficiency. Let's say we have 10 megahertz of band, which, which can be done with a SDR. And let's take just uh, 10 seconds integration time. And let's say I want a signal to noise ratio of five. Now, throwing these numbers into the uh, radiometer equation gives me a noise of 0.01 Kelvin. Warning here, in the material that you have, there's a 10 to seven, which is wrong, uh, as it was a typo, it has to be 10 to the eighth. But the number 0.01 Kelvin is correct. Then I take this um, equation, just uh, form that a bit so that I have the flux on the left side. So <clears throat> my uh, two times, this is a Boltzmann constant, K, uh, antenna temperature divided by the area and uh, multiplied with the efficiency, those the effective uh, antenna area. If you throw in the number, say, I want 0.05 Kelvin, which is five times my noise, then I end up at 39 Jansky. What I'm saying here is that according to the radiometer equation, a three meter dish with these characteristics will be able to give me a 39 Jansky um, with um, a signal to noise ratio of five. By the way, the 10 comes simply from the, the, uh, the number of the Boltzmann constant versus Jansky. So I had to multiply that by 10 to come up with Jansky. And that's actually good news. I mean, if you look at a catalog, uh, 39 Jansky, there are quite a number of sources that can be seen. So let's go and, and look at uh, sources like that. I will be disappointed. So if we just let our three meter dish sit there and let, record the continuum signal, we'll see it quite a bit varying and jumping up and down and doing all sorts of things. And there are other effects other than just the pure noise that affect us. That's gain and offset drift. We uh, um, have heard from Charles earlier that there's a temperature dependence, then you, you can have RFI. Even though it may be low, it may affect your uh, GAN, overall GAN, gain. Um, out of band signals, even with filters, they can affect that. So in reality, you can see the, the scale here. We're talking about plus minus 100 Jansky that this is varying. And even worse, um, if you move the telescope, your background uh, thermal background changes. And what I've done here is I have changed the azimuth of a telescope from, in this case, around 120 degrees to 220 degrees, so varying over 100 degrees back and forth. And you can see that the change in thermal background has a big effect, and it's a fairly big effect. So when you do measurements where you move your antenna, you want to be very, very careful because you can easily be fooled. So um, the radiometer equation and your noise figure is one of the aspects, but uh, for continuum observations, it's not the determining thing. It's gain, stability, offset drifts, motion of the telescope, and so on. That can be very dependent on the type of telescope. And that means that there are actually not too many continuum sources that are easy, uh, that are available to two to three meter class dishes. There's the signals complex. People normally say Cassiopeia is the strongest, which is true, but if a small uh, telescope will look at signals A and signals X at the same time, you see the combined uh, effect of that. So that will give you 2000 Jansky roughly. You can see the Crab Nebula, the Orion Nebula, and when it gets to Virgo A, things are getting really tough. This is a recording. Um, not sure whether it's our two or three meter dish. I think it's our three meter dish. 
where you can just see it in the noise, but uh, you can only be certain if you repeat that, say, yes, I'm seeing this bump always at, this, at the same right ascension that comes. So what does that mean? Um, even though it seems so obvious saying, okay, let's look at some bright source in the sky, uh, which is just sitting there. That's not so easy. It takes a little bit of care, a careful observation of observing strategy. So do I move the telescope or do I rather keep the telescope stationary and do a transit scan? So let's the, uh, let the um, source just walk through. RFI is an important uh, thing that you have to take into account. Uh, I have mentioned that the impact of the telescope movement is quite su substantial and you need to repeat that to verify. So continue observations can be done, are nice to do, but they're not that straightforward. Okay, um, so that's sort of repeating what I said. Estimates just on the radio meta equation are just giving you a theoretical limit, but there are more things to it. And uh, you need to be very careful and verify that. And only if you say a uh, source is actually accessible. And that brings me back to my original statement. Hydrogen is number one. It's so, so much easier to do than this. And I see sometimes people starting with that. Okay, pulsars is our next subject. Um, I think most of you will know what a pulsar is. So it's a pulse emission originating from neutron stars. They're typically um, strongest in UHF range, but L-band is also okay, I would say, uh, where many of us are operating. It's a weak source, essentially, 200 milli Jansky. Comparing that to what I just said earlier, you need 100 Jansky and more. Uh, how can I take 200 milli Jansky? Well, that's because it's this repeating pattern, which I can exploit. And they have a specific subject, which is dispersion. It means that if I observe over a certain frequency range, it, the arrival time of a pulse varies with frequencies. So the higher frequencies arrive earlier than the later. So what I need to do is to correct for that. This is the same thing corrected. They dispersed and what is a completely smeared out pulse here becomes a sharp and nice pulse. Okay, so um, if you wanna, do pulsars, what is your on your wish list? You want a large collecting area. No big deal, yeah, uh, as, for, as big as you can get. You want a large bandwidth uh, to collect as much energy as you can uh, collect. You want a tracking system because uh, you want a long integration time and you want to observe in the, in the band with the highest flux. So that's your wish list, but there are trade-offs. Um, the observing band, Typically, the UHF is not that good uh, because of the RFI situation and the antenna size plays a role. Um, <clears throat> a certain bandwidth, at some point, I need, I need to have definitely the need for de-dispersion. Uh, a tracking system, um, it's cost and effort. And collecting area, of course, is how much space do I have? Can I still track uh, and so on? So, I have to make compromises. And there are two typical approaches that people have chosen for pulsar observations. One is to go into the UHF range, go non-tracking, and with a limited bandwidth, you need to do de-dispersion. And one example is a so-called corner cube antenna from Andrea. Um, that's, I think, uh, is about two meter each, each leg here. And this is just sitting st uh, straight on the ground, looking in the direction of the Pulsar B03, 029 plus 55, which is the strongest in the Northern Hemisphere. And he has been able to observe that Pulsar with that. He used a SDR dongle, so a fairly limited bandwidth, and he used the dispersion because at UHF, the dis uh, dispersion gets so large that you need to do that. And the other example is uh, Steve Olney in Australia who did this uh, glitch observation. Uh, the Avela pulse is very strong and essentially it's a similar scheme but a completely different antenna arrangement. These are uh, for long yagis. So this is 
what can be done. <clears throat> UHF means um, if it's only 2.4 megahertz, you have to very, be very careful where you exactly position yourself that uh, you are not overwhelmed by RFI. And in particular, you can easily overload your, uh, <clears throat> your first LNA uh, due to RFI. The other approach, ah, sorry. Um, Results from the UHF tracking setup. This is a result from Steve Olney. Uh, he observed the Vela pulsar as it transits uh, through his um, antenna beam for two hours. And this is what he's getting. Essentially, this is the pulse. And these are outputs from a standard program. So there's a phase versus time, phase versus frequency. So it's a clear detection here. The other option that you have is to go to the L band, which is a protected area. You can uh, use more bandwidth, but because of the smaller beam size, you need to go tracking. So you have to have a, a tracking system. Uh, three examples, again, JJ um, with a 3.3 meter dish, he used 50 megahertz of bandwidth and he did not do D dispersion because you, that's uh, for this pulsar, it's it's doable. Uh, smearing is not that big. Our own experiment, uh, we went uh, among others with a 2.3 meter dish, the smallest dish. Um, again, 50 megahertz of bandwidth, but we did the dispersion. And then there's a third example that I want to mention is from uh, Matjats and uh, Tadea uh, with 3.1 meter dish, um, 25 megahertz of bandwidth. So this is another option. Um, just quickly show the examples. This is Jean Jacques. Uh, this is uh, Tadea and Matjats, and this is ourselves. So these are the uh, what you're getting. Where's the limit of doing that? Um, I've done a calculation, saying um, again I need. Uh, a sort of modified uh, radiometer equation. You can say, again see the two systems and the uh, integration time and, and bandwidth. <clears throat> and then the uh, sensitivity in this case of the telescope is expressed as uh, as a gain in Kelvin per Jansky. So how much Kelvin and the temperature get it, do I get when I have a certain amount of Jansky? And this expression here describes that when I have a pulse which is short and bright, this is easier to detect than a wider and less brighter pulse, even if the average um, is the same. And I did this calculation um, essentially using this um, equation and making certain assumptions for the gain of the telescope uh, for the famous northern strongest pulsar and say, I want to have a target signal to noise ratio of five. And maybe I either use 50 megahertz or two megahertz of bandwidth. Then I have two different system temperatures and different aperture efficiencies. And what you can see that uh, these different parameter sets are shown here by different colors. So the most uh, insensitive uh, variant with two megahertz of bandwidth is uh, the blue dot in between. So at big uh, dishes, that's not, not an issue. When I have a three meter dish, I uh, get in trouble to use only a small, <clears throat> small bandwidth um, because then I'm above, this, this by the way is the uh, luminosity or the flux of the pulsar. So I ran into trouble with that. So uh, when I want to go uh, with two megahertz only with a three meter dish, things become, yeah, I wouldn't say impossible, but uh, it's it's getting tough. With a two meter dish, I uh, definitely have to have a wide bandwidth. And if somebody says, I have seen this pulsar with a one meter dish, I'm getting, I'm getting doubts. So there's a sort of a benchmark of what can be done. And as soon as you get into this area, you, would have to find very good reasons to say why it is a valid detection. And that brings us to the pulsar verification challenge, uh, because it's always a borderline situation. Um, you can easily be fooled. Um, 
If it looks like a pulsar, it ticks like a pulsar, it may not be a pulsar. So, as you know, the famous word is great claims require great evidence. Questions that you need to ask yourself, can I reliably repeat that? Um, does the measured rotation rate be exactly what it is supposed to be? Is it a broadband signal? All these tests of the characteristics have to be done. And I think one of the uh, most critical uh, tests is this one. If I repeat that, the rotation rate should change. Uh, as the Earth moves around the Sun, so I get different Doppler corrections. And if I see that, I'm pretty certain that that is a pulsar. If I don't see that, I'm getting questions. So <clears throat> pulsars are doable. Uh, we've seen nice experiments in the amateur community, but it's not that uh, straightforward and easy, and verification is a must. Questions? Rich, are there any? Nothing in chat. Okay. Okay, let's uh, then go to sort of the final subject, um, interferometry. Um, the basic principle is that you have two antennas and you analyze the signal coming to the two dishes or whatever the antennas are with respect to the relative phase. And the phase between the two signals changes as the object moves. So if it's, uh, let's say it's right in the middle, uh, you have the same path lengths and they are in phase. And then as the thing moves over, the phase changes. <clears throat> and that has a great benefit uh, when observing continuum sources. Um, We've seen the problems that you have with a single dish. Um, the benefit is that a phase change is, your, your intensity may vary, uh, but that doesn't affect the, the phase. So you're essentially much more sensitive to continuum sources. And of course, uh, where the professionals go in, they knew, uh, they want to achieve high spatial resolutions when they use aperture synthesis. So they effectively combine it in a way that uh, the two dishes are separated. Uh, so simulating a big dish, so improving the spatial resolution. But I think <clears throat> even the, the higher sensitivity for continuum sources is something that is very, very valuable. Now, the point is, it works only for compact sources. It does not work for hydrogen. This is the reason why you don't get a, any survey with a uh, high resolution uh, hydrogen map, which is generated by interferometry. The best high resolution maps for hydrogen that you have is with the big single dishes like the Effelsberg 100 meter. And <clears throat> you can't do that because simply it's very straightforward. If you have a extended source here, the phase difference varies from each of these spots. So there is essentially there are many, many sources as if there were many sources and each has a different phase difference. So it, it's just completely smeared out. So this works only for compact sources. How do I analyze that? There are two approaches that are possible and they're done in the amateur community. One is the phase uh, switch interferometer where you have your two dishes and in one of the signal chains you have a 100 degree phase switcher. So you have something that turn, switches the phase by 180 degrees and then you combine that into a detector and then you make a synchronous detection. Uh, see when I Let's say I switch that uh, phase with uh, 10 hertz. Do I get a 10 hertz signal here, which means that I have a correlation between these signals. So this is one uh, way of doing it. The other way uh, of doing it is, is using a correlator. You can do that with uh, a software solution in GNU radio, for example, or you can also use an analog phase detector. Essentially, the uh, software correlator does the complex conjugate of the two signals and adds those 
And that is the same, essentially theoretically the same as with the phase switcher. So both of the schemes um, have been implemented in the amateur community. Uh, so it can be done. And uh, I would like to show you uh, two practical implementations. One is by Jim Abshier, uh, who uses two three meter dishes in the L band. And this is a phase switch interferometer. Unfortunately, he does not uh, specify, at least I couldn't find it, what exactly the baseline is. My estimate from the size of the dishes and this photo is it's about something like 10 to 15 meter. Uh, and another one example I would like to show is from our own uh, observatory. These are two standard uh, TV dishes with a KU band modified LNB. The modification is simply that these are externally clocked. Uh, I mentioned that you can externally clock these and if you have two of them, you can feed them from the same clock. In this case, it was an analog correlator and it's a baseline of 10 meter. So these, these are the setups. They are in principle not that complicated. And the result that Jim has shown, uh, it was on the Zara forum, so I picked it up from the Zara forum, was that, uh, let's have a first look at the graph here. That's a single scan, so you can see just a little bit that uh, it's going up and down, so you have a correlation there. Um, then if you repeat the scan, you can average that, you get a nice and clear signal. And this is then low pass filter, so taking out a little bit the high frequency noise. Now the good point here is um, if you look at that, that's uh, 23 Jansky. And I mentioned earlier in the talk that doing that with a single dish of that size is not, is not practically doable. It, that would be even below a typical uh, limit of from, from a radiometer equation. Okay, he has created this uh, graph here. This is sort of the intensity over uh, the intensity of the of the fringes over the rect ascension, in this case uh, expressed in sidereal time, and the uh, uh, and the declination. So when you move in the declination up, the source is gone. So you don't see that inter interference pattern anymore. And then when you're at the right declination, it shows. So this is sort of a picture of this source uh, of only 23 Jansky. So it's a very nice experiment and just shows the capability of interferometers when it comes to compact continuum sources. The other example is um, the KU band interferometer. This is a not, not a complete sky scan, but a large part of, of the sky. Um, the right ascension again, shown here and the declination. So what has been done is um, these two dishes, um, I'll show them again, these dishes here, they can be controlled vertically. They cannot be moved in azimuth, but they can be controlled in elevation. So the scheme was to do one or two, maybe three days in one elevation. So sort of writing one line and then doing that. That took quite a while to uh, cover that from minus 30. That's sort of a limit that we have. And uh, then going up to 40 some uh, decrease in declination. And the color uh, depicts the intensity of the fringes observed. And then there is a gap. This is simply because that satellite interference there at that elevation, so you can't do any reasonable things there. As you can see, there are a couple of sources which are well known, Omega, Orion, Crab Nebula, uh, W451, Cygnus A, um, they show up. And then there are a number of dots, and we're hesitant to say these are sources. Uh, they do repeat, but we are not 100% sure because we can't identify the, uh, the source that should be behind it. So 
Um, this is still an open question for us whether these are artifacts or whether these are real. But in any case, uh, think about it. Um, this is with two, just 1.2 meter dishes in the KU band where the emission of these sources is not very strong. Uh, they decline uh, over to higher frequencies quite a bit, but you can still see the sources there on the sky. So what this uh, is supposed to demonstrate that it is really worthwhile once you have done all the other stuff, maybe to consider to go to interferometry if you're interested in <clears throat> in sources and uh, continuum sources. One of the things that has not been done yet, as far as I know, uh, but should be doable as well, to do the same thing with uh, with the uh, Mesas. Mesas are also compact sources. They have the benefit of being very confined in frequency and they should also give a nice um, interferometer uh, fringe, but I haven't seen a successful experiment. It's uh, something definitely worth trying. Now to finish interferometry, there's something that we know what the professionals do, and that's the main reason why they do it. They combine that so that they get high resolution pictures. And this is really high end <clears throat> of interferometry. And it is amazing that this has also been done by amateurs. Um, this is work by Jim Apshier again, who had this uh, two to three meter dish. And he did um, an observation of the Cygnus complex, um, in this case at a lower frequency at 400 megahertz. And he used different baselines by changing the distance between his antennas. Now, <clears throat> the uh, aperture synthesis is something that is fairly complex mathematically to do all the processing. So this is really the big, big learning curve there if you want to do something like that. And he, well, he has successfully done that. Um, he has shown different stages of the processing and his final um, image that he has produced is this here. Um, the, uh, he says the dots are 0.5 hours in right ascension what you can actually see here in this picture is a resolution of the Cygnus complex. So he has Cygnus A here and Cygnus X here. Just remember, this is at 400 megahertz wavelength. So the resolution for a single dish is just fairly bad. Um, you can't, even at L band, you cannot resolve that with a three meter dish. You have to have a much bigger dish to resolve that. And he is able to do that. Um, with a fairly reasonable baseline, it's 20 wavelengths. So if you say it's 70 centimeters or it's 14 meters, roughly uh, the maximum uh, extension. So he's able to do that. I find this very amazing and shows that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for interferometry and still lots of things that can be done. Okay. Um, this sort of concludes what I want to say as examples, what can be done, what can, where are the limitations and so on. And before going into my final uh, famous last words, uh, I would again open the discussion for any questions, if there are some for the interferometry at the moment. I have a question about your rooftop uh, interferometer. Uh, you displayed uh, the final image, uh, beautiful little orange dots. There we are. Uh, what? So I think of that as a grid of mailboxes. What's the kind of resolution we're talking about here uh, in RA and declination? Is it one degree, two degrees, five degrees? Um, I'm actually not sure. Uh, we are talking about... We're at 12 gigahertz, roughly, or 10 gigahertz. 
my roughest guess is about uh, two degrees or so, but I, I really would have to look it up. That's just a gut gut number. Okay, gut well, that, that's the size of the beam. Uh, another way to do it is how many drift scans did he have to do uh, to get that, for example? That's what I'm wondering. How, how much would he have incremented the uh, elevation at a, at a time? I don't remember. Uh, Horst, who did this, his name is on the uh, on the line. Again, it must have been something one degree or so. So this took weeks or months? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a matter of weeks. Magnificent. Uh, if I may, uh, another question from the earlier section. You were talking about uh, with variability of the uh, signal just because you're changing the azimuth and you yes. had a graph to show that. Uh, let's do the easy one first. Why the azimuth? Is there just a loud city nearby or what? No, it's, um, <clears throat> if I mean, if I change the, the elevation, uh, that's very obvious because then my antenna gets closer to the ground. So I get, I, I, I'm expecting to see a change. Um, the azimuth. And, oh, uh, so let's talk about that elevation. Uh, that's simply uh, loud ground coming in there as opposed yes, yes. to the thickness of the atmosphere uh, de de uh, reducing the signal coming in. Yes, that's that's a ground pickup that if you okay. don't know. And <clears throat> the effect of the azimuth, uh, at first glance, you would say, um, I wouldn't see any, any change there. But what you still get is that your <clears throat> side lobes are uh, seeing some of the ground and some of the trees in, in the vicinity, some of the vegetation. So you get something and because you're, you're looking at very small variations, even the, the, uh, the thermal emission feeding into the side lobes do have an impact. You can would, probably would we optimize see the same the, thing if there were no trees in the area? It would, would be better, yes. Okay, I see, thank you. You're seeing the trees out of the side of your eye, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. And um, sometimes um, that's in early in the year, we have the chainsaw fest to mitigate that a bit. <laughs> oh, okay. I see. It sounded like a party. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's work. <laughs> I have a different uh, question. Um, I, I've noticed uh, in the marketplace, uh, ham radio operators are starting to use uh, GPS DOs or uh, GPS uh, disciplined oscillators, and they're getting uh, time accuracies down to uh, less than 30 nanoseconds, uh, which equates to about nine meters of uh, uh wave, of wavelength distance um is there what have you heard of anything or or is anybody working on a uh, longer baseline interferometry between ham radio stations by synchronizing their uh, uh, information uh using gps disciplined oscillator yeah, it's it's an interesting thought and uh, something that we have also looked into. Where can we do long baseline interferometry between um, different amateur stations, uh, therefore getting at very long baselines? Um, the the limitation there is the accuracy of the GPS. Yes, they have ten nanoseconds, but that's on short time scales. Um, the you can expect that. Uh, with a GPS, you're getting a accuracy or a difference between two stations of 10 to the minus 11 in that range. Now, what you want to do is <clears throat> you want to have the phase difference between your two uh, receiving stations um, to be maintained within 40 degrees of, uh, of a signal at your receiving frequency. And if I remember the numbers correct, you would have to have an accuracy or stability or you know, an accuracy of 10 to the minus 12 in order to do a 10 minute observation at 1400 megahertz, keeping that 40 degrees. So when you, when you can live with a short uh, integration time, short observation, you can 
work with uh, less accuracy. Um, so what I'm saying is um, GPS is getting close, but not quite close enough for a longer observation. Um, I should mention that we do some experiments on very uh, long baseline interferometry, uh, which is actually uh, transcontinental between Canada and ourselves. But these are very short observations. So we have we have a rubidium and a GPS, and uh, of course the, the the other they have a water maser. But here we are talking about a couple of milliseconds for correlation time requirement. So that's then easier. Hey, uh, uh, comment on the interferometer there. I had played with uh, one quite a few years ago of uh, two three meter dishes separated by 10 meters at 400 megahertz and using just a uh, uh, modified for AM detection uh, 15 kilohertz band with scanning receiver and about 2 dB noise figure preamps. And with that combination, I was able to pick out uh, I think it was about eight discrete sources, uh, you know, M87, SIG A, CAS A. Uh, there was a you know, few others in there that I could, uh, you know, get. So it's a, uh, and the receiver even had AGC going in it as well, which uh, as long as the noise level is large enough that the noise and not your desired signal is set to your uh, AGC level, the AGC doesn't even hurt you. And uh, AGC is an absolute killer on a total power receiver, of course. Yeah, well, it, indeed, what you're pointing out is um, the sensitivity for compact continuum sources that you get with interferometry is really amazing. Uh, the basic behind that is <clears throat> you're looking at a fringe frequency. So you're looking at a, let's call it an NF signal or even low NF signal in a very uh, confined bandwidth uh, that you're looking for. And <clears throat> um, Going back to this, uh, the way that was done is really um, we we looked at the um, at the occurrence of uh, a fringe signal by doing a Fourier analysis. So it was Fourier transformed, um, and that turned out to be very sensitive. And <clears throat> also, um, you see here, just like yourself. Um, Jim has done that at 400 megahertz. He did that on purpose because the signals. Um, like many other sources, are stronger than in L than at L bit. So 400 megahertz, provided that you get um, a free spectrum, is, is very favorable doing it there. And uh, I think, as far as um, interferometry is concerned, uh, in our community, first people have started. So there are a number of experiments. And I think there's much more that can be explored. It's, uh, it's an interesting subject. And we, we also, we are just starting with that. We have uh, our two L-band dishes there. We have a baseline of 50 meters, which turns out to be actually a bit too much. And we're doing experiments just, in, we're in the learning phase there. And there's a lot of that can be done. Uh, what is the problem with too much? Um, <clears throat> there, there's one thing which, which is a little bit unfortunate in our setup there. Um, we run the uh, RF signal from the two dishes um, to our building. Unfortunately, the cables at the moment are not of equal length and they are not even the same cable. So we have different uh, veloc velocities in the cable. So we have a phase offset in the, ca in the cable. And as it turns out, well, in the first place, it shouldn't matter too much because the fringes should still be there. And yes, the fringes are there. Uh, but what we observe is that uh, when the, as the source uh, moves over the sky, we, we track, we have a tracking system. As the source um, moves over the sky, the time difference between the two signals uh, become bigger and bigger. And we see at certain <clears throat> uh, time differences that the signal decorrelates. So we're losing the fringes. We haven't quite understood that effect. And we thought in hindsight, we thought, well, it may have been better if we started with a smaller um, baseline and then learn about it. We haven't full yet fully understood 
the decorrelation effect, but we think that is what it is, that the correlation length of the signal is somewhat limited and we run into an issue there. And yeah, when I was playing with the uh, interferometers, there was a uh, professor, his name was at uh, University of Scotland that uh, uh, found his uh, class notes on interferometer and, uh, you know, got in contact with him. But uh, it's kind of interesting on uh, uh, how far the antenna uh, cables can deviate in length is related to the bandwidth of the receiver. That if you have a uh, uh, one megahertz bandwidth receiver, then a fraction of a microsecond uh, is beginning to decorrelate things. Have a 100 kilohertz mic, uh, bandwidth, then you can have a lot more uh, time difference in the cables before you decorrelate it, according to him. And that did seem to verify out of my experiments. <clears throat> yes, that's something that, that we're also playing with is what, what bandwidth can we use? What, uh, of course, the more bandwidth you can allow to have the more energy you get, but then you get into a correlation issue. That's um, we are at the start of the learning curve there, and I hope to, yeah, be able to get better results soon and uh, see what how far we can get with these things. So one question I have is that, or thought I have is. You talk about doing these, like this measurement here was done at uh, 400 megahertz, but some of these signals that, that are dispersed, uh, you get the benefit of uh, more gain with a smaller antenna. So you sort of can chase the signal down and, and uh, potentially end up better off at some other point in the spectrum. Is that right or not? I'm afraid I haven't quite understood your, your point there. Um... Maybe if you repeat that, uh, well, I have a better handle on it. Well, like if the signal coming in is a broad signal that's uh, dispersed or it's falling off in frequency, but it's still present, yeah. uh, and you get more gain from a bigger dish at a higher frequency, then uh, maybe you're, you, and you also get away from some noise, then there could be some compromising place you look for uh, to operate at instead of at the one that you think it's got the most signal. Yeah, th that's quite possible um, that, that you're better off at, at different frequencies. In our particular case, um, we, uh, we are looking at our two dishes at a 50 meter base or 45 meter baseline, which are, which are in L band. So we're looking at the 1.4. Um, and the other one was in KU band. We would not be looking at 400 megahertz like Jim did, and maybe others do, because simply it's uh, too much RFI. We, we can't do anything there. So uh, that's that's another constraint, even though uh, the signal might be stronger there. Um, we Essentially, uh, we have to be very elegant in filtering not to get our LNAs overloaded in that spectral range. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me um, finish my talk um, with something um, which I call my 10 thesis of ra amateur radio astronomy. Some of that might be uh, debatable or uh, you might think difference of it, but uh, let me just introduce that as sort of a, some final statement. Uh, first of all, I say my view is there's no such thing as radio astronomy. There are just different objects, different characteristics. And as we have seen through the talk, there are different setups and different approaches that can be done. And therefore, it is necessary to decide uh, and concentrate on one subject. If you're trying to do this and this and this, you're, uh, you, you get lost. My absolute favorite thesis is radio astronomy is physics. Uh, people who learn that, uh, they are studying astrophysics. They are not studying astronomy, they're studying astrophysics. So anybody who will go into amateur radio astronomy has to be prepared to learn a bit about the physics of the uh, things that are up there. It's uh, not so easy depending on, on your background. And I can only recommend read, read, read lots of things. Number four, um, background from ham radio can be very helpful, but also misleading uh, because sometimes the emission characteristics are different from what your next door, no or next door neighbor OM does. 
Um, for example, uh, hams are sometimes inclined to say, if I have a bad signal to noise ratio, I uh, reduce my bandwidth. That's the worst thing you can do in radio astronomy in most cases. So sometimes it's different. Also order of magnitudes are sometimes misleading. Then <clears throat> frequently you hear recommendations to optimize a specific component. Uh, it's a discussion, best LNA of the world and so on. Uh, that's not always helpful. Um, the best LNA, for example, doesn't help you if your spillover is high. So you always need to look at the fault chain, look at everything that contributes to your signal and uh, you need to set priorities where you get the best bang for the buck uh, to optimize your system. Number six, um, you need to, especially if you're beginning, you need to question successes. Um, there are so many ways that you can be fooled by RFI and your imagination. You, it's, uh, you want to see something, so you see it. And you need to check uh, the characteristics of what you see against what you expect or what can be expected from physics. And only if those match also in, this, in the order of magnitude, uh, then it is really valid. And uh, basic rule is each observation successful must be repeatable because the astronomical object will be there tomorrow as well. And because of that, uh, it requires patience and tenacity. Um, depending again on your background, the learning curve is usually substantial. And uh, what I find is that there are many, I would say the majority stop halfway through. I've seen many people starting to build a telescope, a radio telescope. They build and build and build, never and never put it in the air. So. I find it important for people, it's my advice, try to get a first success fairly soon. Therefore, look at a low hanging fruit because it's very important to keep your motivation. If you build something and yeah, no, you're not getting there, you, you lose your interest. So um, don't try to build the ultimate telescope uh, where everything has been optimized before you put it out in the sky for the first time rather get an observation. And then once you have a signal, that's a starting point also for optimization. Software is an important part. Um, my suggestion is always don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are existing tools. Um, there are tools from the professional community. They may come with an additional learning curve, admittedly, but they so save a lot of work later on. And um, then, of course, you want to build on the experience of others. Ask, everybody should ask questions, but there's limit to that also. If you ask questions, not, not dumb questions, but questions where you just enter the keyword into Google and get your answer and you're just not lazy, uh, or too lazy to do that, then people get frustrated to help you and you might lose support. So try to help yourself a bit. Don't get lost in there, but uh, ask a few questions, look around. And then, yes, coming back to my favorite one, thesis number three, astro uh, radio astronomy as physics. To conclude this talk, um, radio astronomy for amateurs has become a wide field. And uh, as we've seen, there are so many options on all levels. Um, there are many things which are possible uh, which have been impossible 10 years ago. And that's basically due to advance in RF components, SDR and computer power. For example, the hydrogen uh, emission is so easy to see these days and it would be uh, yeah, many years back and would be almost mission impossible for amateurs. And it's not an easy subject. It takes quite some dedication and the willingness to learn. But my main headline is it's just lots and lots of fun. Thanks very much. Right, any more questions for uh, Wolfgang? All right, let's see. Uh, I got uh, Preston, excellent uh, talk, Wolfgang. A lot of good information. Stephanie, great presentation and overview of what is possible. Thank you. Okay. Any more? Uh, any more comments? Questions for Wolfgang?
Wolfgang, I want to thank you for such a wonderful talk. Um, I have uh, just lots and lots of notes of things to do. It's kind of like a, a menu of thing, uh, new toys to go explore. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. <clears throat> All right, we're getting a lot of good comments in chat there, Wolfgang. Uh, go ahead and uh, uh, look those over. Uh, no no yeah. new questions, but uh, I want to thank you very much. This was an outstanding talk. Yeah, you're an excellent keynote uh, speaker. Um, also, by the way, our first Sarah member to get an FRB and uh, with his team. And so uh, look forward to more uh, accomplishments from uh, you and the Oster Peeler group. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks.